Folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. My guest today is an Afro-American musical wizard. He developed his chops on the bandstand, growing up at the tail end of swing and developing his own style within the bebop language. My guest understands the African roots of his music and merged this with the blues of Chicago, which were coming up the Mississippi Delta. He found the groove in bars and nightclubs, ballrooms and burlesque houses. Could have been the London House or the Regal Theater, swinging his band and merging two different tunes by raising the hand, by raising the hand and showing one finger or two. My guest has an entrepreneurial spirit. He never plays the same song once, preferring the improvisational melodies that make real jazz what it is. He has done this before, during and after the record industry helped create an identity for cats like Dizzy Gillespie, Thelonious Monk, Ramsey Lewis, Randy Weston, Horace Silver, and Milt Jackson. He's toured the world playing late into the evening at Oil Can Harry's, a club in Vancouver with the venerable Calvin Keyes and fellow Steel City bassist John Hurd. He's cut albums and soundtracks on Argo and Chess, Catalyst, and 20th Century. Today we live in the 21st century, where labels have stratified music. This has led to a rigid radio structure and a shrinking record business. Throw in the fact that six night a week gigs are non-existent, and the music community faces a supply and demand crisis. How do you create your own individual sound in academia? How do you get more secure on the bandstand without the consistent live engagements? How can you develop an identity in a business that values Twitter followers and looks as opposed and looks as opposed to burning music you can feel in your gut? Looking for answers with a legend, Ahmad Jamal. Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. It's good talking to you, Jake. You, you, you said a mouthful there. How did you know I did burlesque, though? Well, I've talked well, to that's, that's a hidden secret. I was in Calumet City working for $70 a week back in the 40s, late 40s, and you had no intermission, and there were no days off. And I put in my notice <laughs> immediately, if not sooner. <laughs> that was a hard but How did you find out, or did you find out? Did you know it was Calumet City, to be specific? I, no, I mean, I mean, no, no, I, I'm going on a strictly gut because I've talked, honestly, the... The strip clubs provided incredible employment for for the cats. I mean, you were playing two or three sets a night, and the strippers would ask for you know they'd call out Duke Ellington tunes or jazz tunes, and then or you know milestones or whatever. And, they'd be, and you guys would be playing over the top of it. But I just took a chance that. Well, <laughs> you you absolutely correct. Oh, Calumet man. City, outside of Chicago. Calumet City. Burlesque, Un- Burlesque House. Unbelievable. Hard, hard work. Really <laughs> difficult. The only way you can take an intermission, the only way you can have an intermission, if you want to, you had to play, you had to become the drummer, and he would, or he became the pianist. There's, there's no such thing as intermission. Eight hours straight. Eight hours straight. I mean, that, um, was it just a was it just a drums piano duo, or were you playing in a trio? What, can you paint the no, picture? It was a quartet. It was a quartet. The the, the leader was a, a saxophonist. So it was a quartet. Who was the leader? I forget his name. <laughs> Unbelievable. So you were, but I mean, this was late forties. All right. So I'm glad I nailed that one. I, mean, I wanted to. I want to. I want to. Re- you know, I've I've woodshedded pretty hard on Mod and, and uh, over the last five years, I've interviewed f- close to five hundred cats and. There's one guy I wanted to... Yeah, I saw you had Jimmy Heath there. I would love Jimmy. Jimmy's uh, approaching 90 and still going. He's a a, a, a piece of uh, wonders. Unbelievable, Jimmy. Jimmy uh, Heath. You know what? And uh, a, a really, uh, like, a beautiful person, too. Like, an amazing player. But, uh, you know, he was down for the... We just started having a jazz festival in Tucson. Maybe I can get you down there. But he just came down last year to play with the big band. and uh, Tucson? I, I wrote a composition called Tucson and recorded many years ago. If I find if I can figure it out, I'll send it to you. All right. So, I, I want to. I want to. Tucson, AZ, baby. Um, Tucson. Tucson. In fact, Calvin Keys is on that that, that that track. Well, we'll we'll get into another that. Another thing. Uh, pardon me. You know, go you ahead. Think? Go ahead. So another thing you mentioned uh, that I appreciate 
is the uh, uh, famine out there for youngsters going into the music business. Assault on intellectual property is something I've never seen before in my life. Amazon, YouTube, and it goes on. There's, there's, there's no tire records. Colony records is gone. There's no no independent chess. People like chess, forget about it. Like Leonard Chess, the company that I had helped make, make along with uh, Bo Diddley and Muddy Waters, uh, 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 the uh, wonderful uh, uh, man out of St. Louis, and, and uh, I forget the, uh, his name, but there are four of us that made chess records. I helped to form, a, to, to, to form the jazz division. That kind of independent, that's the, there, there are no independent labels anymore. It, no more is finished. I mean, I'm, listen, I'm 38 years old. I, I, I do this show because I want my children to know how real music is made, future generations. But it's it's upsetting and scary to me because um, when you when you make... And also, the other thing is, like, you just mentioned Bo Diddley, uh, Muddy Waters, yourself. I mean, I, you guys came up, jazz was right alongside the blues... And there really was no there labels. It was not a genre obsessed situation. You were just playing music, and we've become it's become so stratified. Uh, and there it is an industry. It's not an industry anymore. It's a business. It's a small business. And you know, with all the pro tools and all the technology now, you know, you can sound terrible. You don't even have to be good. You don't even have to be a good player, and you're going to still make millions of dollars. I mean, it's it. We have the music business is analogous to everything going on in our society right now. It's greed. Absolutely. And uh, I tell you, unless you have a buffer, uh, that is a, a good lawyer, honest lawyer, good management, and something that's almost non-existent, a good record company. And you have to tour to sell records. There's no way... Most of the records are, are sold on, on a job because there are very few... Uh, big record companies, uh, uh, independent, no independence, only a few few companies conquered Sony, and then you have to start thinking. <laughs> so where, where are they going? Where are the youngsters going? Tell me. Well, I mean, they're, 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 they're making, well, and they're not even making LPs anymore, let alone, uh, you know, albums where... Uh, they're not making albums. They're making an EP or one or two cuts and throwing it up on iTunes and seeing what happens. And and then, um, you know, because listen, I'm a, you know I could walk into any Goodwill thrift shop in Tucson, Arizona, and chances are I'm gonna f- find w- during the course of a week live at Pershing. You know, uh, you know I'm gonna find your albums and your face and the liner notes. And the point is that it created identities. For, for, for cats like you. So there's, and, and there's such a glut of material now, and we do have the YouTube, and there's so much out there that, and we don't have venues to play at. So let's face it, how are you supposed to develop your individual sound if you can't get up on the bandstand six nights a week? How are you supposed to develop an identity if you can't get a record, if you don't have any independent record labels, like you said? Uh, you know, I mean, there are, there are a multitude of, of issues that I think are very correctable, but it, it comes down to the values of a society. And the whole whole thing about my show is that I look back and I tap into cats like yourself who were creating well before I was born. And you really, um, yeah, you might have played in some upholstered sewers or burlesque clubs, but you know what? I mean, it was a it was an elastic system, and because of that, the language of music grew all musics. And you wonder why we have a stifling of that now. Well, we just broke it down. Well, the uh, reason we came up, Jake, with this historic record still being plagiarized, used in the British of Madison County by Clint Eastwood, used in uh, uh, the uh, uh, Wolf of Wall Street, still being used and, 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 and emulated all over the world. We were an artist in residence residence at, at the Pershing Lounge in Chicago. And you're still talking about finding that record. And the other person who made chess was Chuck Berry. I couldn't think of his name. It was Chuck Berry, Bo, Bo Diddley, Muddy Waters, and myself. Wow. Those yeah. were the four that, that, that made chess records. I started the jazz division 
later on, Ramsey came in, and, and uh, Richard Evans, one of the late Richard Evans, one of my favorite uh, composers, he did many projects with me. The first commission was Macanoo that we did for Chess Records, but Chuck Berry, Muddy Waters, Bo Diddley, and myself, we made that company. You know, I just want to say something about Richard Evans. I, I was trying to get, I, I connected with his wife, and he was very ill. He had taken a turn. But that dude, what an arranger. I don't think I realized that you, I don't think I realized that you and him collaborated so much. But that's really warms my heart, because that dude, also, I have him playing with um, uh, this black mandolin player on Blues Way. He's playing upright bass. It's like this sick, it's ridiculous. He was a filthy, filthy upright bass player, too. Uh, he was not only uh, uh, my, fa my, my favorite orchestrator, he was in Robert Farnham's and uh, the league of Johnny Mandel. He was some orchestrator. He was at Berkeley for 17 years plus. And he called me one day about a pianist who was studying orchestration with him. And her name is Hiromi. Wow. Have you heard Hiromi? No, I sure have. And she's one of the biggest out there now. We have been managing Hiromi for 13 years. Me and my partner, we've been managing Hiromi for 13 years. And she's not only a great artist, she has great spirit. She's a wonderful person. And that's what makes a great person is their, their, their spirit. And, and their, it's a joy to be around her, you know? So Richard introduced us to Hiromi. So Richard stands uh, prominent in the, in the field of orchestrators. He's one of the most talented people with that pen that I've ever met in my life. And he ta taught at Berkeley for over 17 years. He was head of the orchestral department. He was head. Yeah. And, and they don't make him like Richard anymore. No, then. they don't. And, and, then, and then before that, all the stuff he did with chess, uh, with the soulful strings, he made... You know, string strings just come alive. I, I, You're too young to know all this stuff. <laughs> and I've been listen, man. Well, you have. I've been, I've been after you. I've been after you for for, for four years, brother. I, I'm I, I'm ready to go. But I want to read. I, I really part of this is also creating new history, and I really believe that. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's there was a band called Oregon. I don't know if you remember that. They, they, oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. There was a cat named Paul McCandless. He was a multi-read instrumentalist. And I, when I interviewed him a few months ago, I asked him about nonverbal communication on the bandstand. And this is what he said unprompted. He said, one of the things I loved about Ama Jamal was his sense of form. He didn't just play tunes and then improvise on the same material and go back to the tune, head, chorus, his head. He had very elaborate arrangements and a system for cueing the band, moving from one tune to the next, from one section to the next. I found that similar to classical music in the sense that the composition was nearly as important as the improvisation, whereas in East Coast jazz, improvisation was really what counted. The themes were kind of throwaways. I heard Ahmad mixing two standards one night. They played the first section of the standard, and then Ahmad would hold up two fingers and they'd go to the bridge of the second standard, and then they'd stay on the second standard and go back to the first. He did that with one finger up, two fingers up. Very simple, but very effective. So, tell me about merging these songs, because to me, that is one of your trademarks and I'd like you to t so merge that with nonverbal communication on the bandstand well that ability uh, Jay comes from my hometown uh, my beloved Pittsburgh uh, Ray Brown Pittsburgh Kenny Clark ex-patriot Pittsburgh <laughs> Art, Art Blakey the wonderful Billy Strayhorn whose family I sold records uh, papers to when I was seven years old he had gone with Duke then Wow. Earl Garner, you ever hear him? Of course. We went to, and, and a forgotten uh, pianist, one of the greats, Dota Marmarosa. Definitely no, know, know, I know him as well. J.C. Moses, Booker Irvin. And it goes to uh, John Hurd, of course. He, he's from Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, the late Stanley Turn team, Oscar Levant, Earl Wilder, the, 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 uh, the, the great uh, 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 pianist in European classical tradition, uh, tradition rather, and uh, 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 Andy Warhol's in Pittsburgh too. 
I didn't know that. And a little, uh, a little uh, uh, tap dance, it may have hurt Gene Kelly. <laughs> we have the Kelly Strayhorn Theater in Pittsburgh. I, I, I say all that to say this. That's where I developed that description of my orchestral approach to music and my uh, conducting, because all music has to be conducted, whether you're doing a duo, a 90-piece orchestra, quartet, that's making a difference, has to be conducted. And you, and you must uh, 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 have that kind of discipline in order for, for the, uh, uh, the statements to ring true. And I've developed a tremendous repertoire in my youth in Pittsburgh. I was playing, playing with guys 60 years old when I was 10. I joined the union at 14. The minimal age was 16 at that time. Of course, the, uh, uh, the uh, president looked at me. He knew that I wasn't of age, but he let me join anyway. So that tells you uh, or explains to you how I developed that ability to go into these uh, uh, American songbook uh, repertoire and, and, and combine this and combine that because I developed that in Pittsburgh. Did you, so were some of these elder statesmen that you played with, were they doing that? They were merging to, I find that, because if you look at improvisational uh, psychedelic rock music that came out of the, you know, the Bay Area, they were off, a lot of bands would go one tune into another, into another, uh, but when Paul told me this, I think he saw you in some, some rural part of Pennsylvania in the mid-50s. Um, wow. So, I'm, yeah. so I mean, did you were those? Could you could you point specifically to somebody that uh, a mentor that 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 taught you about how how important? Um, I guess you said it was or, or, uh, every everything has to be orchestrated. Or, um, uh, but can you just talk about how uh, who, who influenced you specifically? Uh, Joe Kennedy, a great violinist when we had a group called the Four Strings. And we couldn't get work, and Joe went back uh, into teaching, left Chicago, went back to Pittsburgh. And I inherited the Three Strings. So I inherited leadership unwillingly. It was just a result of the, uh, the, the, um, the uh, group, the Four Strings, breaking up with the absence of Joe, but he's the leader, director, and he was the main uh, source of orchestrations for the group. So I inherited the, the role of leadership, and it's, the rest is history. That's how it happened. But my influential person uh, uh, was Joe Kennedy when it came to, to, to the role of leadership. I've seen some interesting, you know, that leads into my, my, my next question, because you mentioned Kenny Clark. I didn't realize he was from Pittsburgh. Uh, Max Roach, those cats um, put a uh, changed uh, ri uh, drumming, or at least in in theory that uh, you know through the the history books they are given a lot of credit for sort of reinventing jazz drumming as far as using rebound and and not using the bass drum uh, so heavily, and not relying on it so much. But I look at some of the trios you had Kennedy with, with Kennedy or with you know these trios with on Argo and Chess. Can you talk? Yeah, that, was, that was Ray Crawford on guitar. What a great guitar player! But I wanted. Did, were, are there some? Was there? Is there a drummer that you can talk about that that flies below the radar, but helped um, helped expand the, the the African rhythms in your mind? One, one of the most important to have extraordinary, not great drums, extraordinary drummers. Most of them from New Orleans, beginning with fabulous, the counted uh, uh, Bernard Fournier, unbelievable. He's one of the most emulated drummers in the world. You can't patent the things he did. And if you could have patented it, he would have been a multi-millionaire. The things we did, he did on Porciana, for example, they're heard in every sector of drumming. Uh, and still being uh, emulated. So. Number, numero uno, uh, Bernard Fournier, then the great drummer, who did the drum book for well, one of the most successful Broadway shows, Idris Muhammad. Wow, I did not know. When did you play with Idris? I, Idris worked with me uh, uh, 
late uh, uh, 90s, in the 90s, he worked maybe ni- uh, 1990 onward until about, around 1997. He was with me, and uh, uh, what a sensational drummer. Then I have heard on Riley, who was with, he left me and uh, went with went with Marcellus and the Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra for about 17 years. He's another unbelievable. All these guys from New Orleans then, I had uh, James Johnson, who people think is a Pittsburgh native, but he was born in Shreveport. Another Louisiana drummer. Something there in the water. Earl Palmer was Earl Palmer was down there, but I guess you probably never played with him. No, it was those are my four uh, main, uh, you know, Papa Joe Jones worked with me too, you know. He, wait, oh, please stop. Okay, that's that's <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> he worked with me at the Embers when I we went back to a, a performance. I, I left Chicago. I was going to Juilliard and uh, never got there. Joe Glazer started booking me. He booked <laughs> me in the Embers, and my, my, my drummer in the Embers was Joe, Papa Joe Jones. <laughs> I mean, Can you believe that? Well, I mean, I just, could you go a little bit deeper? Because I'm trying, this is important because, listen, we've had, you know this better than anybody, the drum track came in in 1975. Everybody now is listening to electronic music. It's a drum machine. Sometimes it's it's a real drummer, but they've been, they've been the digital beats have been crushed into their ears for so many years. And I'm trying to get back to this idea of melodic improvisation Specifically, what the drum? I got one word. I got one word for these uh, uh, disgusting commercials with that 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 synthesized music. Yeah. disgusting. It's disgusting. I it's... mean, you can sell Toy. Why can't you sell Toyota with with, with Duke Ellington music? But well, I guess I'm uh, the thing is that what <laughs> I'm trying to get, what I'm trying to say is like, or, or it, Brubeck. <laughs> I know. Well, no, I mean, you know, we're, we're, I mean, yeah, Cal Jader was on traps, but it's like, you know, listen, you know, younger. I can see my daughters, they get, it's already in their ears. So I'm trying to get back to this approach of open space, and I, maybe with Fournier, if you could break down one, or Papa, what they were doing uh, rhythmically with your, fitting themselves in and, and kind of recognizing that even within, if they got lost, any note can be the one. Could you talk about some of the techniques they use? Because I just want other drummers, younger cats, to know how to play free, how to let go and play free. Well, you know, this, this thing, uh, uh, there are the only, the only four or five cities that have the parallel, that are parallel to development as New Orleans. It's Pittsburgh, Memphis, Detroit, Michigan, uh, Kansas City, uh, of course, East St. Louis, St. Louis, I said miles come from East St. Louis, these cities created the Sidney Bechets, a producer Louis Armstrongs, the Billy Strayhorns, the Miles Davises, if I may say, the, the Jamals and, and, and the Johnny Costa. Johnny Costa also was, it's Pittsburgh, you heard him on Mr. Rogers, that pianist that was so unbelievable was Johnny Costa. You ever hear Johnny Costa? I, no, I, I have all those Mr. Rogers records on vinyl, so I, I know his name. He's great. Unbelievable. So these cities develop what you're talking about. Unless you have this kind of this kind of background and growing up, if I may, it's not going to happen. Not going to happen, Jake. You have to these 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 people, and of course the Gillespie, uh, Charlie Parker era uh, uh, was so influential. Revolution. Those are revolutions. You you don't have revolutionaries anymore. It may it may be. In the future, I'm not saying it's never going to come, but you don't you don't have the revolutionaries like like uh, Gillespie, uh, uh, Charlie Parker era, the Louis Armstrong era, the Sidney Bechet, the Miles Davis, those rev- uh, the, the 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 Dave Brubeck, the Paul Desmond, uh, those those revolutionaries are, are, are non-existent right now. You have a lot of technology, but who's making a statement? That's enduring. Who's making that uh, take the A train? That's or lush life, or, or, or the things that the uh, John Coltrane did. A little simple thing. A little, a little uh, uh, from the American song songbook. My favorite things. Okay. Yep. These people 
took these things and interpreted these things beyond the wildest dreams of their composers. That's what makes up the American classical music, sometimes referred to as jazz. How do you account? How do you? Okay, but you talk about these four or five cities. How did? How can you account for that regional sound that did occur at one time, like in East St. Louis or Chicago? Where I mean, can you just talk about Chicago because you know that that's where you sort of started to cut your teeth? You know, I mean, how did? Chicago is where we 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 we, we traveled in Chicago. It did, it did have all these. People who will connect with Chicago were not Chicago natives. Chicago was a melting pot, if I may. George Coleman traveled from, from Memphis. To Chicago. I traveled from Pittsburgh. Bernard Fournier traveled from New Orleans and worked in a place called... Uh, the, 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 Little Chess also owned a nightclub called the Macombo. He was not only an a, a entrepreneur in the record business, he was also a nightclub owner. That's where I found... Bernard Fournier. It took me a long time to get him to join my group. <laughs> Israel Crosby. Israel might have been born in Chicago, but that's that's a, a, a rarity. Most of us, we migrated to Chicago, and uh, uh, it was a melting pot. I think uh, Vaughn Freeman was also, I worked with him too when I first came to Chicago. Uh, but most of us, we went to Chicago to find our place in society. There are very few cities uh, 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 that parallel the aforementioned uh, New Orleans, uh, Pittsburgh, Detroit, Memphis, uh, East St. Louis, Kansas City. Kansas City, and yeah. And it happens all over the world. You know, Paris pr- pr- produced uh, some, some extraordinary reveal, Debussy. It's just, it's just that's, that's the chemistry. It happens. That, uh, I, I can't explain it, but that's the way it is. And from that comes all these monstrous uh, contributions to the culture of the world. Um, I was uh, transcribing something uh, from my interview with uh, the drummer Joe Chambers, and he said that, uh, you know, in the 40s, and I think you can speak to this, I mean, the ballrooms were housing uh, jazz uh, music, which was dance music at the time, of big bands and whatnot, and then... He talked about this uh, surtax that came in uh, on the ballrooms, and uh, those th- those ballrooms were converted into tab- tables and chairs and nightclubs. So it was more people were coming in and sitting down. People talked about at that time modern jazz not being danceable music. He said no, it was the surtax on the ballrooms. Can you shed any light on that? Surtax on the ballroom. It wasn't just, it was on baseball games, and it was for the world, it was for World War II, it was for funding for World War II, but the point is That's that... That's interesting, because I've never heard of that before. I just, did, did you, did you make, did, was there a conscious sort of understanding on your end when you, when you saw that jazz no longer was dance music, when it became a sit-down, and you couldn't really pat your foot to it, because it leads into what, what Ramsey Lewis was saying, was that once it became more of a formal sit-down thing, people stopped tapping their foot, and then the musicians felt sort of felt like they had to overcompensate, and the music became too complex, and then people said, this is not what I was hearing at, you know, the, uh, you know at, at, at the Embers or, or at Howard Rumsey's Lighthouse. Or the I got one answer for that. I'm going to quote, dude, don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. <laughs> yeah, but when did, yeah, Exactly. <laughs> I, 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 if it don't have that swing, it don't have that pause, forget about it. Any, anything that's too complicated uh, is not going to work. I don't care if it's a meal, a marriage, a friendship, piece of music. If it's too complicated, something is wrong. Life is, is not that complicated. So if, if, if there, there are things out there that uh, are so complex that you can't, tap your foot to it, I don't want it. If there's no pulse, if, if, I, when, when a doctor feels your your your, uh, 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 your wrist, if there's no pulse, or your body takes certain pressure points for your body, there's no pulse, you're dead. If there's no pulse, you're dead. Music is dead. If there's no pulse in music, it's dead. And one of the, the, the person who started getting, I'm, uh, you mentioned Kenny Clark, the person who's Perhaps started the modern jazz quartet was Kenny Clark. Right. Did you know that? I did. Are you really? 
I think so. I think Kenny started and then he moved to France and never came back except on rare occasion. But I think Kenny Clark was the person who started the modern jazz quartet. And everything that those guys played, John Lewis, Percy Heath, Connie Kay, Mill Jackson had pulse. Delicate things, uh, uh, Mozartian, and sometimes in, in structure and, and, and structure don't, but it had pulse. If it don't have pulse, Jake, forget about it. I'm with you. No, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I mean, th- this is. It's dead. It's dead. And anything that's over, so complicated, I don't care if it's a meal, uh, uh, life is not, and music is not. Uh, 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 it's dead w- without. Without pulse, is bad. Well, well, I mean, the only can you? So complicated, no pulse. I mean, uh, 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 one thing, one of Ravel's most revered compositions is Bolero. And it's a repetition, repetition. And they had little guys in Morocco whist- whistling Bolero. That was his, that had a pulse. Over and over. This to Ravel's, uh, and uh, talking about an orchestrator. Ravel, like John Mandel, could get things from the inside of orchestra, Richard Evans, too. Uh, get things way deep in the inside of orchestra. That's John Mandel's great gift. You listen to one of the great records of all time, Shirley Horn, the great diva, and John Mandel, Here's to Life. Right. Ravel, Ravel wrote, wrote there's those like that. Robert, but, but, but there's always life and pulse. They're, they're, they're complex writers, but the pulse was never neglected and if music is, is so complicated that, that there's no pause forget about it you, you're supposed to getting back to your point you're supposed to always be able to tap your foot everything is danceable there's been so many dance companies that have written me about their presentation dancing to Point Siena all from all over the world and it's still good. There's no such thing as old music, it's either good or bad. <laughs> they're still they're still programming Mozart. Every, and Duke Ellington is a baby compared to Mozart. Right. Poinciana is a baby compared to Mozart. They're not my composition, but my my arrangement. And as I said before, there's no such thing as old music. It's, cause it, old, it's either good or bad. And it endures forever. So uh, that, that getting back to uh, the, the people not being able to pack their foot, no, no. If, it don't mean a thing if they ain't got that swing. Not to be repetitive, but no. it works. <laughs> talking, to Ahmad, talking to Ahmad Jamal here on the Jake Feinberg Show, and um, th- can you talk to the audience about the first time that you went to Africa to perform and um, was, you know, sort of, I've talked to so many cats who are like, you know, you grow up in the States and you, you get this vision of Tarzan and the African people are very loud and, and boist and obnoxious. And then you go there and I, I just want to get your, I'd like to get that story on the record. First time you went to Africa to perform and what you thought of it going in and what changed coming out. Well, the first time I went, I didn't perform. I went to, uh, to uh, Egypt and Sudan. Later I performed in, in Johannesburg uh, in Cape Town. And, uh, Africa has been the source of, of, of much. A lot of people think that uh, Africa is just uh, uh, Johannesburg. Africa is from Egypt to, to Morocco to the Cape and, and so, forth, so forth and so on. And the, the, the culture is, is be, be beyond belief. I'm not talking about the present day happenings. We're in chaos everywhere, including the United States. That's right. <laughs> so, but, but, but Africa was, in one word, impressive. That's all I can t- impressive, and, and, and it, it's it's uh, it's a shame what's going on now culturally. Be it Greece, or be it uh, uh, Paris, or be it uh, 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 United States, New York City, uh, uh, Chicago. Things ain't what they used to be. I'm quoting Duke again. Although I think Mercer wrote that, not Duke. I think his son wrote that. Same <laughs> well, thing. Wait, hold, but can you talk about all right, so? But yeah, forget about the gentrification and the the oil drilling and the you know the colonialism that of today. But you said impressions. Can you talk about one specific impression that you that was profound for you when you when you went there? 
uh, when I went there to perform. Yeah. But when I went there to perform, that's that's not uh, it's, it's not uh, uh, so uh, so far back. I, I went to Africa to perform the first time about ten years ago. I never performed there until I went to uh, Johannesburg to play the festival there. And uh, I was impressed in, in all of uh, everything. One thing uh, that uh, uh, stuck with me, one of the, the promoters came to me, Jake, and said he was in tears when he spoke to me. Because he said, uh, we used to have to play golf with no lights. And we became great golfers because we were on the golf course with no lights. And he never thought he'd get a chance to, uh, uh, I think his father was a fan of mine, I'm not sure. But he was in tears when I came to uh, South Africa to perform. Because I turned down many, many uh, dates, many times because of the uh, apartheid policy that I wouldn't work Africa. So that's why I went. So it took me so long to accept an engagement there. If, if if everyone couldn't come, I wouldn't work. No, and, I uh, no. Let's let, let me go back to when you first yeah. went went to Egypt, though. That that was profound for you. Oh, that was 1959. I've been planning that trip since I was 11 years old. Though I've been planning that trip since I was 11 years old. I knew that those were my origins, and I was able to uh, 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 be host by one of the leading professors of Africa, Dr. Shawarabi. And when I went to Sudan, I was hosted by the ex-minister of the interior, Sheikh Abdul uh, Rahman. And of course, they, they both deceased there, but the beginning of the university system starts in Africa. Now, al is, is the oldest university. Our universities, a uh, pattern became pattern after al Assad between you and I and, and the lampposts. <laughs> and, and I made a speech there in 1959. Because I didn't go there for for for, for uh, uh, touring. I went there or, or to, to perform. I went there for other reasons, and I went there as fulfillment of something that I was planning since I was 11 years old. Because those are my roots. Absolutely. Those are roots of the African American. We we're indigenous to the continent of Africa, and iron smelting and so many things developed there. The cradle of civilization uh, 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 perhaps lies in Africa, okay? So many things, uh, the, the universal system, the university system is, is patterned after al Asara in, in Egypt. Did so, you, you know, I mean, were you, were, you, were you going there? I mean, obviously it was a trip, but those professors, did they also, were you taking classes with them? Did you, did they? No, no, they were just my host. I was staying there and, uh, and I was, uh, Quite celebrated when I, in fact, I was going to, to, to build a house in uh, Heliopolis, but my mother was still living. And I, I, I didn't want to be isolated from her or her, so I came back to the United States. Of course, I could have had a house there too, but it, it, like uh, Henry Threadgill, he has a house in India. <laughs> right, uh, right, 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 right. Uh, uh, and he just won the Pulitzer Prize. You know that, don't you? Henry Threadgill. I'm learning stuff. You've already dropped some knowledge on me today that I'm going to have to, uh, you know, get. I'm going to have to research. You're, you're teaching me some stuff, but. Um, well, well, Henry Threadgill's uncle, Nevin Wilson, used to play bass with me when I was working singles at Jimmy's Palm Tavern. I used to play singles at Jimmy's Palm Tavern in Chicago. <laughs> and Nevin Wilson, bass player, who is uh, uh, Henry Threadgill's uncle, that's. Why Henry Thurgill and I was hooked up uh, so vigorously because he knew that his uncle and I were very dear friends. So uh, mentioned this. The fact is, I could have had a, a house in in uh, Egypt as well, like like Henry has in India, but uh, I didn't. I didn't build uh, and I didn't buy, as opposed to what he did. Although he's getting ready to sell his house in India, but uh, I came back to the United States because my mother was still living. And I don't want to be isolated from her. No, no. I, um, you know, I, I often ask my guests this. Uh, I was just, I wanted you to talk about your concept of, of love and how you, you, just your concept of love, because I feel like we we talk about the insanity of the, in the, all over the world in every place, including the United States. 
um, and there's a callousness that's in, there's a callousness that's enveloping. Um, and he, pardon me, Jake. He that dwell on the islands are not safe. <laughs> it's not even safe on the islands. I know. I'm with you, man. <laughs> it's just, it's chaos everywhere. I mean, you just you know. I mean, and love, you know, and love is love is the answer. Isn't that a, a Beatles? Uh, isn't there some lyrics about the Beatles talking about love? Is oh, the absolutely. Answer? Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's all you know. Um, <laughs> You know, but 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 it's easier said than done, and I just I'd like you to maybe refer to uh, some something in your career or life where it, it demonstrated the kind of love that you bring. It, it would be easy for you to say, "Well, I I, I I channel it through my music," but I just wanted to know from you about your concept of love because I just feel like you cats, you guys, we need to drive consciousness forward, and and the only way it's going to happen is by hearing from cats like you. Well, you know, I, I don't know what what I've done. I just know that I'm, I'm, I, I keep keep trying to do it. And one of the, the main uh, uh, factors in that the main ingredient is is love. You have to first, but first of all, you have to love yourself. You have to love what you're doing and what you're involved in before you can transmit to others. That, that I, I don't think we. Uh, love ourselves enough, and as a result, we're, we're, we're stepping over and on helpless people and, and, and creatures that need our assistance. And uh, I think uh, we, we have to discover love within ourselves first. And it's something uh, that uh, that is hiding that, keeping that uh, from developing. And it's, it, it, the, the result is chaos. Uh, uh, love for all, hatred for none. That's what has to happen. And if it if it doesn't happen, then we're going to continue to be in trouble. So things are going to get worse before they get better. And if if the philosophy of the people doesn't don't change, if it doesn't change, I'm sorry to say, things are going to get worse before it gets better. We we're in the third world war already, in my opinion. Well, I think you're 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 channeling a lot of the things that I've already been saying. Um, how, how, uh, when was the first time you touched the Fender, you played the Fender Rhodes? Oh, that, that, that's another guy, Harold Fender, what a lovely man. <laughs> <laughs> Harold Rhodes, brother. Yeah. Uh, he, he joined with, 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 with Leo Fender. But Rhodes Piano, uh, Harold used to teach uh, uh, soldiers that were recuperating in, in hospital. Harold Rhodes was a wonderful guy, special man. And I was introduced to uh, to the Fender Rhodes when I was uh, 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 producing records on 57th Street. Orrin Keep News office was right above mine. <laughs> I think he had Riverside Records then. What did you? What were you? I, who were you producing for? I was producing. I had a session where I was producing a uh, Sunny Stip. Oh one of the few organized sessions for Sunny Stip. I had Ron Carter, Herbie Hancock, Grady Tate in the rhythm section. Oh. And and and, uh, and Herbie introduced me to the uh, Rhodes piano. He said, "I need a Rhodes piano." I said, and "She said, have you ever played that?" And that's how I started uh, my uh, association with Harold Rhodes. And uh, I called Rhodes piano. I, I rented the Rhodes piano for for Herbie for the session. And Herbie said, "Sit down, and play this." And I did. So I called Rhodes, Harold, Harold Rhodes, and. I endorsed it. Uh, I endorsed the instrument, and he sent me two. He sent me one for for Herbie and one for myself. <laughs> and and Hal Rose and I had a loss a relationship just blossom until his death. He's a wonderful man. That's my uh, my story with the, with the Hal Rose uh, with the Rose piano. I'm gonna. Re- I just got one more question for you. I'm gonna read you this this quote, and uh, just want to get your feedback on it. Um, It's from one of my interviews. Uh, It says, uh, working with Ahmad was a very big step for me. I was just trying to get to the next level, and he was already on on top of the mountain as far as I was concerned, and that's where I wanted to be. It was quite a challenge playing a guitar with him playing piano. With two chordal instruments, if it wasn't right, it would clash. I learned quite a bit about certain notes and certain chords he would play. I didn't get in his way but did enough to still inspire him and drive him to new heights. Ahmad's music for me was an education all the way. And that was from our friend Calvin Keyes. 
No, he. He's I, a great man. I called him. Man. I called him because because I I told him I said you know I'm gonna get a chance to talk to Ahmad tomorrow, and he said, well Ahmad owes me a call. I said you know put the, hang up your hang ups and just call him, man. You know, so I'm glad he called you. But but <laughs> but you know. When, when did you interview Calvin? Calvin was one of, I, I started my show in 2011, Calvin was maybe my fourth or fifth interview, and since that time, he's helped, I've promoted a couple of concerts that he's been involved with in South Central, and I just saw him recently in San Francisco in an organ trio, that cat has continued to carry the, the lineage forward and the love forward, so much of my show is predicated on that, trying to just get younger cats to feel the music, and um, I just wanted to know actually how he actually even came on your radar. Calvin Keyes is a special uh, special person. You know, he has a special uh, personality. He's one of those uh, 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 people that, like Hiromi, with the, the, the right attitude as well, because you can't be a Calvin Keyes unless you have that kind of character. He has, uh, 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 he has a wonderful, he, he's exemplary, may I, may I uh, uh, state. And, uh, the joy of working with him. He did that thing in South Playa with me. I had uh, Calvin Keyes, Joe Kennedy, George Coleman. Donna Burr was supposed to be there. I had uh, uh, seven pieces on, on the, I uh, had, uh, you, was it you were on his school playing drums? That, that, Cause he worked with me too. What, 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 uh, what session is, what session are you referring to? I'm talking about a, a double uh, uh, release, a double CD release that we did at South Play in Paris. Uh, Calvin's on that, one of the most beautiful uh, uh, solos on uh, uh, record is, is Calvin's solo, I think, on, on Autumn Leaves. Uh, I, well, I mean, to me, it's like, also, the, the sublime thing is that he's on, it, he's not given credit for it, but the MASH soundtrack... That is unbelievable with you, you know. That's Richard Evans, too, you know. Oh, I Richard, Richard did the orchestration. I took Richard to Hollywood, and eventually he moved out there and started doing stuff with uh, Natalie Cole and, uh, and, and Tebow Bryson and so many others. But I took him to Hollywood to do, that was my first assignment with 20th Century Fox. When I, when I signed with 20th Century Fox, Russ Regan, who was... Another uh, Leonard Chess, wonderful person, wonderful, and he knew the record business. There's no more Russ Regans anymore. Right. If he's still around, I hope he hears me. <laughs> he, he, he signed me. He signed me on the strength of something that uh, Rich and I had completed, and I sold the, the, the entire session to 20th Century Fox. And our first assignment after I signed with with with, 20, with uh, do do a portion of Johnny Mandel's theme for Mash. Another one of Jack Mandel's great feats. That's theme for Mash. That's his composition. It used to be called. I think it was called. I think from from inception, suicide is pain, painless. That's right. But they changed it. <laughs> Am I correct? Oh, uh, you're right. You're 100 right. No, and 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 <laughs> I, I just. I mean, so that was that's my first assignment with 20th Century Fox, and and Richard was was my orchestrator for that. I have a water damaged copy on vinyl of that. It's my fa one of my favorite vinyls, but the, my favorite Ahmad Jamal, and I have no idea how it even came to be, was uh, was was live at Oil Can Harry's. I, I I I mean, did you did you after the session did someone come up to you and say, hey, I, you know, we recorded that, and how did that wind up going to print? Because I mean, a guy that that another cat who's been uh, just a, a total warrior for me is John Hurd. I've gone to visit Johnny. He's not playing anymore. Um, he's, he's a great sculptor, you know. He's a great artist. Oh, dude, he's making. Graphic he's made. He's, he's probably a made a. Graphic artist as well. He's one of the great. He's, he's Count Basie's favorite bass player. One of mine too. But he's so talented in other areas of artistic endeavor that he could make a living just from his drawings. Oh, I know that he's making, culture, when I saw culture. him, I saw him last summer, he was making busts of Duke and all the jazzers. M amazing, beautiful busts of all these faces. I, I, I'm sure he made one, he's got to make one of you. I don't know about that, because we lost touch, but all kind of areas, you don't want to hear about the history, that's another story. Okay, all right, listen. That's another story. Hey, no, 
Ahmad, listen, I, 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 we've been burning for 50 minutes here, man, but um, I, I just, I, I hope maybe down the road we can do part two sometime. I just, I, I really, um, it was so such a high honor to connect with you, man. And, uh, well, I don't know if you're going to use this interview or not, Jake, but take the bad stuff out and only use the good stuff. <laughs> Thanks so much for calling. It's been a pleasure. Love always, man. Take it easy, all right? <laughs> okay, Jake. Cheers, brother. Ciao, ciao.